Greg Rosen, welcome to the 34th chapter of the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. I am your host, Peter. Tonight we sit down with the legendary Jay Robbins, with bands to his credit, such as Government Issue, Burning Airlines, Kimora, Channels, Jack Potential, Jawbox, Moral Mazes, Office of Future Plans, Regents, Report Suspicious Activity, Roll Kicker Lay Down, Vivid Low Sky, and of course, his solo work. On another end of the spectrum, Jay has done production work for a myriad of recording artists, working with such acts as Clutch, the Bakertown Group, which is Clutch's side project, Jets to Brazil, Hey Mercedes, Shiner, The Pauses, Time Spent Driving, The Dismemberment Plan, The Mon Orchid, The Promise Ring, Pilot to Gunner, Paint It Black, None More Black, Jawbreaker, Discount Against Me, Modern Life is War, Stapleton, Murder by Death, Black Cross, Lemuria, The Sword, Coliseum, Small Brown Bike, and so many more. Aside from all of that, he is a devoted father to his son, Calum, a devoted husband, and an all-around phenomenal human being, as you will find out during this discussion. So, folks, if that doesn't give you an idea of how well-rounded and amazing Jay Robbins is, this discussion will. So, without further ado, I give to you Jay Robbins on the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. You know, that's that's like story of my life, basically. I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a luddite myself, and uh, you know, my wife. This whole podcast thing is my wife's idea. I'm a, I'm, oh. I'm I'm a fanzine guy. I, oh you know, right, okay, gotcha. Right, fanzine know, versus a podcast. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I'm I'm in my late forties. I'm on the wrong side of forty. So <laughs> <laughs> I uh, this was her suggestion because she was sick of my shit during the uh, pandemic lockdown. Right. <laughs> you need a hobby other than buying vinyl. So okay, I'll, that's what I'll do. <laughs> well, it's a good, I mean, it's a good thing. It's also good that people got hobbies in the pandemic. So, Absolutely. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm traveling with an iPad that is really ancient and I thought I was going to be all cool and be able to do it on the iPad and I installed Google meets and it even functioned for about 10 minutes. And then, uh, and then I got a, a, a notice that actually it's not supposed to function on the OS that's with the iPad and just whatever. It's a story of my life. <laughs> I find it interesting that uh, a human being who could legitimately cull sounds that are so massive and and so warm and open and beautiful cannot figure out uh, an iPad. <laughs> but that that it sounds like me. It sounds like me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's more just a matter of patience, honestly. Than you know, it's like it's it's not you know, yeah. I don't know. I'm still maybe more of an analog guy. So another, maybe that's why another analog boy in a digital world. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So, I, I know you're not familiar with what I've been doing here, but um, normally what I ask of everyone that comes on right off the bat, and it sounds ridiculous, especially when you're in our age group, but what is it that terrifies you on an existential level? Whoa, that's pretty, let's just jump right in there. That's a pretty heavy one. <laughs> um, wow. Just one thing. <laughs> I know. It, you know, there's, it could there's be a few. A, there's more than one. It could be a multitude. I mean, uh, it terrifies me on an existential level. Uh, I mean, uh, honestly, like, you know, maybe like severe illness, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of things, you know, I mean, I, I am, um, 
but I'm pretty skilled in my application of denial. So, you know, if I, like, if I, no, you know, I mean, I think as most people are right now, right? Like if you, if you really take a minute and contemplate climate change and, Mm -hmm. and the way that the world is going to go because of that, right? If you take any one single factor out of all the, all the factors in the shit show that is modern civilization in 2022, right? Like pick one of them. If you want to talk about, climate change that's a huge one and if you think about how the world will be impacted by that um and the fact that you know people are conditioned i think people condition themselves and we have a culture that sort of you know our version of the apocalypse is you know we like to act as if it's going to be a, um, a singular event like the apocalypse will come and then we'll experience it boom and then it will be done kind of thing but i actually think it's happening in slow motion in this sort of, you know, bit by bit, you know, extinction of species and everything. So, um, you know, and so it's just going to be a case of like things get incrementally and then probably like, uh, exponentially worse for people and people are going to survive through it. And, but they're not going to be fucking psyched, (laughs) you know? So, I mean, if I think about that, like that terrifies me on an existential level, but there is, you know, there are little things that we can try to do about it as individuals, but the change has to be systemic. So I'm like, really a certain amount of denial helps keep you sane when you're faced with something like that, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's one thing I think like, uh, the Supreme court terrifies me on an existential level right now. Right. Like me too. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, just the, the direction of politics, right? Like I read this book recently, not too long ago. It was actually a couple of years ago. Um, I, it might be called before the flood, but I can't remember actually mm-hmm. it might be, might be, but basically it was a book about the Weimar Republic, um, yeah. you know, in the years before Hitler. And it just rang so many bells to me, you know, the kind of like, um, petty divisions and serious divisions on the left side of politics. And, you know, they were trying to build, they were trying to build a post-imperial Germany that was like a a democratic Republic, a socialist democracy that was, you know, basically incredibly well-intentioned and all the forces on the left just spent all their energy, you know, backbiting each other. And, you know, it just, no one took Hitler seriously until it was too late. And then he ascended to power. And then, and just to see, you know, I mean, that is just too close to read about that was too close for, so, you know, I mean, it's it's very close. It's very close to the bone because there was a very large part of me that did not take our former president seriously because he's a reality star. He was the guy that I'd grown up mocking in the eighties as a, right. He's a fucking clown. He's a clown, but yeah, but the, but the he's, um, stick, he's swinging yeah. right now. Still out of office is absolutely terrifying to the point where the state I live in Pennsylvania is mm-hmm. that we're strongly like it. it, it they're considering nominated or, or electing Dr. Oz right to, to our Senate. Like really, Pennsylvania, where are we right now? And, and, you know, it's the same thing because Hitler was this idiot on a street corner espousing the virtues of a backward idea of Marxist socialism when in all reality, he was a neo-fascist. Right. I mean, I don't think, I mean, I, this is probably not a discussion that I want to go too deep into, but right. You know, national socialism was never socialism. No, never, ever. Right. Yeah. So, and this is a, this is one of the, like many, many things that drive me really crazy, you know, in the current day when, you know, people are like, uh, people are, uh, certain people like to say things like, you know, Nazism, that stands for national socialism. They were socialists and I have to go like, Mm-mm. they were not socialists. Karl right? Marx so, would roll in his grave, roll in his right. grave. Yeah. Yeah. And Sir Thomas More uh, would definitely roll in his grave. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so, so there, you know, there's, I mean, there's a lot, you know, if you're, if you're compiling the book of very bad things, you got a lot of, you got a lot of, uh, uh, content. 
<laughs> to work with right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Especially, especially when, when you bring up something like climate change, because in all honesty, there's a, as you'd said, there's a very cumulative effect that is transpiring right now where there's no one thing that you can really shake your stick at. It, it's a multitude of things. And, yeah. you know, like right now, had I been playing in a band, uh, like the bands I'd played in, in the late eighties and early nineties, I'd have a lot of fodder to sing about as would you. And I think we yeah. did then. I think we definitely did then in the Reagan era and before. But I think now it, things are actually worse, like 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 incredibly worse. It's very, it's very, very. But you know, the other thing that I think for like you know, I'm I'm going to be 55 in June, mm -hmm. and so I'm a little bit older than you. But I think we're in the same boat that like you know we experienced the Reagan era as kids. So it yeah. wasn't the the sense of like the impact of um, the impact of politics. It wasn't. I mean, speaking personally, it was something that I thought I cared about. You know, I had causes and beliefs, and I was like developing my political views, and I, you know, I was really passionate. But I don't think. I mean, I know. I guarantee you. Like, I didn't understand the real world. You know, it w It was. You know, I experienced it at a remove because so much of my energy was just tied up in being young, yeah. you know, and it was invested in my creativity and looking at what my friends were doing and, and, you know, and just, um, all of which is wonderful too, all of, all of which is great, you know, but, um, but I think, um, you know, sort of growing older and having a lot more life experiences and kind of feeling like, you know, I don't know, you have, I've had a lot of time to, to really understand the real world impacts of, um, of things that happened in the political arena. And when I was a kid, it's like Reagan was a cartoon villain. Yeah. And I think, you know, Trump is even worse because he, he, he's, you know, he's like a cartoon villain from, I mean, uh, I mean, I don't even have the words, but like, um, but I think, you know, I no longer, um, you know, there's just a different sense of what the actual impact is when you're living in your parents' house and you're, and you're like 21 versus like, you know, being in your fifties and owning a house and having a family and, you know, all the, the, all of that, that stuff. And, and so, um, you know, and I mean, uh, creativity is important and catharsis is important and you have to like do things to keep yourself sane in a, in a crazy world that seems to just get crazier you know, you have to, I mean, you know, none of these things are unimportant, but I also think like, um, it isn't necessarily, you know, it isn't, it isn't about, you know, I mean, I routinely chastise myself because it's not enough to sing about these things, but it's very hard to know what to do to have an impact except, you know, you know, whatever voting and you can make your contributions to whatever cause you make and maybe it's you know whatever cause you support and maybe it's putting in time you know volunteering or whatever it is but you know i mean singing about things it you know i mean i know personally that if that that element of catharsis is is really important to stay sane and it's one of the things that I've gotten from, from, you know, connecting with music when I was younger in the first place, you know, and, you know, going to see music and hearing songs and, and, you know, experiencing other people's music and then learning to make music. I mean, the, uh, these things, I would be lost without, without them in my life. So I know that they're super important, but, um, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I, I don't, I mean, 
you know, singing a song about fuck Donald Trump is extremely, um, like it feels great. And it's a sentiment that everybody that is important to express, but it's, yeah. it doesn't even scratch the surface. And it's, it's, that's another thing that's super scary is just like knowing how to, how to push back, you know? Well, but I mean, it's, you know. yeah, th- if you think of it this way though, I, I mean, having grown up, you know, the, the child of hippies, well, my dad was a Vietnam vet, but he soon thereafter became a hippie as well. And mm-hmm. having, having, uh, you know, Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan, all the way through to when the clash happened and Joe Strummer to, you know, hardcore, there was always that voice of dissent that was extremely important and, you know, reached the right people and the wrong people would always slough it off. But, you know, speaking, yeah. speaking to what you're saying, it, it may, maybe you think it's not enough to sing about it, but I well, think, I think it's, I think it's vastly important to hear it on the other side. Right. I mean, I, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Cause it's like, because the, you know, like the arts make can help the arts help people make connections with each other. So, yeah. and that's the number one most important thing, you know, that there is, is like the, the connection. So, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's as, as simple as like, I mean, there's like so many dimensions to that. And certainly like the political dimension is not anything that like, I'm not, I'm, there's no way I'm trying to diss that. I'm just saying, you know, I feel like, like there, there are, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we're not, we're not actually talking across purposes whatsoever. Cause you know, I, that's those, those kind of political messages were things that I needed to hear when I was younger. And I, and they were like a huge part of my education in trying to constantly you know, I mean, they, punk, the whole reason punk was so attractive to me in the first place was that it was a whole new set of perspectives. Like I thought I was supposed to, when I was a teenager, you know, I knew I was a weirdo and I knew that I didn't fit in. And I thought that I was somehow supposed to magically adopt this um, paradigm of normality that, you know, was in full bloom all around me in the suburbs, you know, that, in, that just included, it was in, almost entirely made of elements that made no sense to me. And so when I found punk rock, I was like, oh, this is a different paradigm that is all about challenging and asking questions and saying, you know, why do you think these things are good enough? Why, why is this what, you know, uh, why are we all supposed to sign up for, you know, this kind of um, path and doesn't, isn't the world a bigger place than that, you know, like, and it opened such a huge doors for me that, you know, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I would probably not even, I, I'm not even sure I would still be here on living if it were not for that, you know, so yeah. And, it, and the, pol- the politics is like a huge part of it. So, yeah. And, and, yeah. and I think more so uh, not just with the political sphere and the artistic sphere of it, but well, maybe more so the artistic part of it. You, uh, what you'd done in your career, I mean, starting way back in government issue, like it, you didn't, you never kind of rested on your laurels. Did you, you know, you always sort of expounded upon, uh, maybe like the base ideals of, of, you know, what punk rock had given you and then revolution summer thereafter. Uh, and you just allowed your artistic flag to fly really w- without, without adhering to any sort of stricture musically. And I, I think, I well, think that's I appreciate pretty, that a lot because that's what, I mean, that's about the nicest thing you'd possibly say. <laughs> it's it's the really truth. Cool. <laughs> and, and like I, I, Zach Brokus had just been on uh, maybe like two months ago on, on the show. Mm-hmm. I told him the same thing, like legitimately what you guys had done. Uh, it, it still sticks with me in a very visceral way because it didn't marry any one set of rules. And it was, it was, um, I don't want to say punk rock by proxy because that's not right. It was, Mm -hmm. it was punk because it didn't really care 
what it what it aligned with uh uh in an in an oral manner you know in in a, in a musical manner it just it just did what it did in a very deliberate way and and that made it punk well that's i mean i super appreciate hearing that and i but i know i mean i know what you know i know it it's funny because i think if you talk to zach and if you talk to me and i'm sure if you talk to kim and bill as well like they're part of the part of the thing that worked in our band or that made gave the band its um you know it, its um identity is the fact that you know i think we were not all 100% going after the same goal you know yeah. and i think but i know like speaking personally um um I had a very, very good mentor when I first got into punk rock um, in the form of Damon Locks, who was, um, you know, who is an an amazing artist and musician um, who now he now uh, his project right now is Damon Locks Black Monument Ensemble, um, which, you know, is based in Chicago. And so and he's also an amazing visual artist. And, you know, Black Monument Ensemble is a big collaborative ensemble that's, um, you know, influenced by all sorts of things from jazz and Sun Ra and um, the kind art, of, um, the Black art church trend. music. And, you know, yeah, but the, but the thing is like a big way, I think I hear a lot yeah, of but, Sun Ra's orchestra in that. But, uh, you know, when when we were teenagers, Damon and I went to the same uh, this art magnet program in um uh, Montgomery County in, in Maryland. And that's where I met him. And there were a few other kids and Damon and a couple other kids in this class kind of took me under their wing. And that those are the people that, that I started going to shows with and the whole, um, their whole ethos about punk was if you can, if you can, um, if it's too easy, if it's too easily codified, you know, if it, if it's um if it if it's too easily characterized and satisfies your expectations too much and is too obviously punk right out the gate you hear you hear something you see something and you just know what it is and you can almost fill in the blanks um it's not really punk. Like what, what yeah. the, all, all of these kids that I were in my circle at that time who were kind of giving me my education about punk was that it, it was about the unexpected and a certain amount of challenge in the art, like, like challenge the artists challenging themselves, like everyone and for, for all of us in that circle, it's like, when the band, if a, if you loved a band and then they put out another record that was just like the one they put out before, it was like a bit of a letdown compared to a band that was obviously always pushing and trying to expand their vocabulary, you know, trying to um, trying to uh, to top themselves and go in places that, that were unexpected. That's something that that you know those kids really valued and so i learned to value that too right like it's it's like you want you want a challenge you know you don't want something that it, it's like if it's too easy it insults your intelligence and exactly and and so that always was in the back of my mind as i start you know went from being somebody who was going to shows and getting records and trying to figure out what i was into you know to starting to actually play music it's like well this you know you could do something and be like i would also be like well that's not enough it has to be more of this or more of that and you know to a degree that almost backfires sometimes because it's like you're trying to sort of over you know there's plenty of things in the in you know i would say there are some overcooked moments in the jaw box catalog but i think that that desire to like not just be, you know, off the rack, um, w- was probably a very strong unifying element for the four of us in the band, you know, that's like, what other kinds of music can we make with this 
energy that we have, which was, was, and definitely is like a kind of critical, you know, sort of thorny energy, you know, and, and also a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a melancholy energy, like, uh, you know, like, um, like if it's a protest, it's a protest because we're disappointed that, you know, this is the, this is the world that we got to work with, you know? <laughs> yeah, abs oh, absolutely. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, you know. I, I think if you look uh, at even what some would construe as the most commercial moments were very, very off-putting to the casual listener, especially at that time period, because Chinese fork tie does not sound like smells <laughs> like mean spirit. <laughs> Right. Yeah. No, I mean, Chinese you know I mean? is a cra that's a crazy, that's a, that's a, that entire song is a leap of faith on the part of all of us that like, you know, triumph, that, triumph. You know, well, you know, uh, thank you. I mean, I think it's a triumph for Zach, you know, it's an incredible, it's a, it's, there's, it's very rare that you hear um, a rhythm that you've never heard before. So when someone in your band, but also well, a rhythm that you never heard before that's also really good and compelling, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And when it's someone in your band that brings that to practice, you're just like, whoa, whoa, how are we going to build on that, you know? So it's a cool, I mean, and that's a really great value. One of the most, you know, wonderful things about playing with Zach when, when he started playing with us is that it, it turned our, our uh, workflow kind of upside down and it and it it meant that we had to kind of be prepared to build songs out of anything and he has always been very prolific in you know when he sort of sits down to conceptualize stuff or come up with rhythms you know if he plays he's going to come up with something cool and and he's less likely to want to play to your song that you brought and where you know cuz i in jawbox i i brought a fair few songs that I kind of, you know, when I hear, when I come up with songs, I kind of hear the whole thing in my head and I would, my natural inclination is to dictate to people how I, not to dictate, but to be like, here's what I hear everybody doing. And I have this kind of detailed idea and, but I don't want to be a dictator, but I do have a, a pretty fleshed out concept, sort of a, an oral picture in my head, but playing with Zach, I could never do that. He would not want to be, you know, the, for him, the thing is like, it's like what happens synergistically, what happens when the people are in the room together and what each person brings to it, that's what it's going to be. So there's plenty of times that I brought songs and I was like, well, here's my idea. And he would play something 180 degrees opposed to what I had thought was, was going to happen. And I would have to adapt and we'd all have to adapt. And then we'd sort of get to a new place together and when that worked out really great, that was like incredibly inspiring. And sometimes it was, for, you know, it didn't work out and the songs would sort of bog down and not get finished. Or, um, you know, I would be frustrated and I'd have to just be like, well, look, I better grow up and, you know, get with the program because this is the mechanics of this situation. And I mean, you know, 90% of the time, it we would end up with something that we were all pleasantly surprised by in the end, which was really, which is a wonderful thing to be able to say. And then once in a blue moon, you get a song like Mirrorful, that is essentially the thing that I heard in my head when I showed the riffs to the band. And it, 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 it just, everybody just did the appropriate thing right away without even talk, hardly even talking about it. So it's almost like we all were on the same page and boom, the song came out. But you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of the other collaborative, more collaboratively written songs are just like, they are those kind of cool leaps of faith that it's like, where did that even come from? You know, which is, yeah. which is gratifying. Now, how does that work? Like conversely speaking, now that you're doing the tour you're doing? Well, I don't play, I mean, there are songs that like, I, I play very few Jawbox songs in this, <laughs> Um, acoustic configuration. If that's a, if this, you're talking about this tour where um, Gordon and I are out playing with Bob Mould. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, there, there are, there's a lot of Jawbox songs that just don't translate 
to this format and I wouldn't dream of trying to play them. And, you know, and then there are some like static is a song that I feel comfortable saying I wrote. And in fact, I didn't, when it was originally written, um, I didn't feel comfortable expressing everything that I wanted to express as clearly as I should have expressed it. And so I went back, you know, a few years ago and actually sort of reclaimed that song and sort of said, you know, I'm going to write this song as a grown up who wants to be understood. And so I, so I, you know, there, there's a version of that song now, which is the one that Jawbox plays, which is the one that I recorded and which I play in the acoustic set, which is much more, it's much simpler and it's much more direct. And, you know, that's a song that's basically has its, its, its underpinnings are like, here's the harmonic progression and here's the vocal, like here's, here are the words and the melody. And so it could, it can, it's portable. It could be played all sorts of different ways. And, and that's, you know, and still be the, be that song. And that's the kind of thing that I've been much more interested in post Jawbox, you know, and post burning airlines. Um, because burning airlines, burning airlines had a, a very angular approach too, but I, but I think what what I was really poking at with this current tour is 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 not the not the content but the dynamics, because right now you're not like the, it, it's not a push and pull of like a few different individuals who come from very dynamic backgrounds. Now it's just you know your solo material, maybe a couple throwbacks here or there. But uh, it's it's a more singular vision, maybe I, I would assume anyway. Yeah. And, and yeah. How does that? Where does the excitement come from there? Just in the fact that you're you're expressing a, a very singular and and very, uh, you know, not I don't want to say one sided because you know it's your music, so it, <laughs> you get well. To do no, what I you mean, want well, I mean, it, I but, think I think also, but this is the you know this is the thing. Like I. I, I really, when I got, when, when, uh, Bob invited me to come on these shows, I was like, Gordon has to come with me because, you know, there's from a practical standpoint, there's, there are melodic ideas in the songs that I just can't execute on just as a solo performer on singing and playing acoustic guitar. I can't cover all of the things that are important in the songs. And also Gordon is is an incredible player and he's also a great he has such great sense of he's just like a perfect um collaborator in terms of either being able to know which what are the essential things that that he should cover from what's in the recorded material or just being like like if I bring a song um and you know it's a the, basically the song is written as a flow of you know the changes and the melody and the words or whatever. Like he has an uncanny ability to come up with kind of supporting material that makes everything richer and be in the spirit of what I brought. Which is like that's I mean, and that's also, but that's also the 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 thing that is it's kind of been an important pursuit for me, like. Like in Jawbox, um, you know, uh, I was an important collaborator. I was a, you know, one of the drivers of the band, and I sort of drove a lot of the material. But I also kind of hid behind it too, like, like I kind of let the collaborative aspect. You know, I, I was sort of like, on the one hand, happy to be part of the, part of this collaborative effort. But on the other hand, more and more, I've been listening to, you know, the music that I just, I guess what I'm trying to think of a pithier way to say this, I feel like, um, you know, you have to have a point of view, like, and sometimes you get an interesting, you know, like a band can create an interesting collective point of view. They're on the same page enough to be coherent you know somebody like fugazi is a great example on the same page enough to be coherent but on different places enough 
to kind of throw in wild cards and make it an interest, a more interesting ride. Right. Yeah. But, um, but like internally I've always just been like, you know, uh, particularly with writing lyrics and stuff, I would like, I'll hear melodies right away if I'm, if we're working on something or if I'm working on something, but I started listening more and more to songwriters who, who want to be understood, who are like, you know, yeah. like a lot of times in the past, I was, I've been uh, not able to write, uh, not able to say, I'm going to write a song about this subject X. Mm -hmm. Like a lot more, it was like writing stream of consciousness, stealing a phrase that I love from a book or a poem or something, or taking a bit that Kim had written or that Zach had written and kind of retooling it to kind of fit my vocal phrasing or whatever. It was just coming from all over the place. And it was, it was like the meaning kind of evolved out of the process of doing it. And that's not bad. And I still write that way sometimes, but I, I just feel like, like I'm, we're supposed to be here to, like I had just had a kind of epiphany at, at a certain point where I used to write to get a catharsis and sometimes I'd be afraid to be clearly understood. I'd be like, Oh yeah, but you know, I don't want to make it too clear, or too obvious. And more and more, I'm just like, you know, do you want to be understood or not? You know, yeah. <laughs> so and I was um, going to, I was actually, that was one of the things I was going to bring up next to you, which is pretty great that you already sort of broached this topic. Uh, your earlier lyricism, uh, it was, you know, creative, beautiful. Yes. Oblique. Definitely. Yeah, super oblique. Yeah, super oblique versus you know, especially the past like ten, fifteen years, you've become more clear in your intent and and more concise in your wordsmanship to the point where like I can legitimately, you know, draw a parallel somewhere. Like, okay, that's kind of what the, he's trying to talk about here, versus twenty five years ago. 30 like, right yeah I, i'm thinking no like, right i hope so i mean i mean st static is an example of that you know like static was supposed to be static was a song that was originally written like i wrote that in the i mean musically it's super influenced by the first lemonhead single and you might not know that at all but it is right but musically there's something about that single where i heard it and i was like oh my god it just unlocked something for me that i was like it's things really can be this simple how amazing is that and it also kind of whatever harmonically kind of scratched a certain itch or whatever but lyrically it was inspired by um my you know my sister decided to leave my my half sister who's 11 years older than me who was a really big influence in my childhood she left my family she quit she wrote letters to everybody and she quit the family for 10 years and um and i kind of didn't know what to do with it and so i wrote this song about it and I was terrified to be understood. And in, and then in the intervening time, I've just been like, you know, this is a time capsule of a thing that was like super important. And um, it's in some sense, it's written to her a little bit. And it's also, it's just a, you know, and it's also like to myself, like, oh, I'm trying to understand this situation. And I'm just like, it'd be nice if, people had a fighting chance to understand a little bit that that that's really what it was about and like you know it's so so it's those those kinds of things i just started realizing that all the songs i really loved that really affected me profoundly not all of them but a lot of them the majority of them are like they put it out there you know and it's not it's like you know it's not couched it's not you know there's a certain thing about like being poetic that can be great but if you're poetic because you're hiding that's not cool and you know i think to me like i was either hiding sometimes or i was trying to just trying to be clever with words because it was enjoyable but but the you know and i would tell myself there was a there there i could rationalize it in my head like and have this cathartic experience singing the words but the the real there you know, it's like the real there maybe wasn't as there as I wanted it to be. And that's, you know, I just want to be real, basically. So, so that's, you know, and that's, 
the part of it too that's part of wanting to do this kind of solo thing is just sort of saying you know i love collaboration and i love working with people who um whose whose aesthetic and who's you know whatever they're bringing like i want to work with them because i love them and respect them but um but it's like I don't want to end up in a place where I'm hiding behind someone else's great chops or their great, you know, whatever they're bringing is kind of, uh, enabling me to, um, not, not be real, you know? Yeah. And so, I, I mean, so that, I, yeah. I think everything you've done has been real. Don't get me wrong. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I would never would have gleaned that content from that song uh, the actual, you know, right. meaning just like in, in my opinion, songs like, you know, savory was always about heartbreak to me. Is it really? Well, it is, it is a little bit. I mean, I think you're, I think also like we're all allowed to take our meanings from, from songs and, and, you know, like if it, if it's, if it, if you have a use for it, then, you know, then by all means, it's as valid as, you know, once the song's kind of out there in the world, if someone takes it to heart, then it's, just that's just as real as anything else too you know but yeah i mean savory savory is a um it's a pretty layered i mean it's pretty layered because yeah. it's it's def, it's it's definitely like a breakup song yeah. you know that's how i've um, taken it but I, most people that i'd known at the time when that song first came out did not glean the same thing from it that i did hmm. Hmm. You know, but to me, it was right. a very smart ass, almost like piss taking on a certain person. You, you know, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit it's a little bit that way. And then the lyric is also a little bit like I'm I'm, you know, uh, making I'm comforting myself by sort of putting it in this intellectual framework. And I'm just kind of examining. I'm like, oh, well, you know, um, this, you know, this person is getting a lot of self-worth out of the you know sort of objectifying herself i mean i feel like in some ways it's a pretty immature song but i also know that there's like a lot of like the pain that's in the song is real yeah and the fact in the the, the, the chorus is actually like the uh, one hand will wash the other mm-hmm. it's basically just an acknowledgement that you know this was a situation between two people who were just making it worse for each other yeah. So it's like, and we were both complicit in a thing that was bad for both of us. And so that's, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of the essence of it. And then there's this sort of, you know, there's a sort of intellectual kind of critical trapping trappings in the song about, you know, objectification and, you know, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's pretty much a, a breakup song. Yeah. That's the, I'm, I'm glad I gotten it right, but I, I can, I can legitimately tell about 15 people that i'd grown up with that haha i was right (laughs) but well i I mean it's you know it's sort of pretty gratifying to think that anybody was listening that closely is pretty cool (laughs) well i'm i'm not too uh out myself as some kind of uh strange hanger on but i've i've been i've been pretty much tuned in to everything you've done since approximately 1989 Wow. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great to hear. Thank I was, you. And since I was like 14 years old. So, yeah. Well, but uh, I, I have to say, I, it's been a really, really gratifying journey too, because to start at the very beginning and then go directly to that last solo record, it, it's, it's really, a, it's, it's a massive leap. It's a massive Whoa. leap and it's and it's a very gratifying leap too because it becomes intimate toward the end. Uh, you have to decipher toward the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then if you take the ride, it it's as if everything is sort of um the keys are handed to you and and everything's open at that point and and and, and very uh intimate and austere almost. Like here 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 it is. Here's just everything laying bare for the taking and and well, that's not lost on me well that's cool that's 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 i mean that's wonderful to hear um, yeah i mean I, I appreciate that greatly 
I, I have the feeling that you'd uh, you'd taken in quite a bit of Keats and the like in your lifetime, just just based on your writing. Well, not not as much as I would like to have, honestly. Like I don't, you know, I'm not as much a reader as I want to be. Um, and if I had like one writer that was a, like the biggest influence on me, it's probably it's probably J.G. Ballard. It's it's not, um, but it's, but it's not, you know, it's partially just because Ballard has this, um, this, he, because he has an alienated perspective and his version of his, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's it. And that, and also just his, his kind of wordplay, like his economy with words and, um, and his imagery just, you know, and the, the concerns in his writing, they, I don't know. They just, it's the ballad really speaks to me and, and he really speaks to me and he, not just in his content, but in his style, yeah. he really speaks to me. So, I mean, I, I wish that I was more of a poet and more of a kind of poetry guy than I am. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, um, you know, it's not to say that I'm not, I'm, I am more than a lot of people I know, but, uh, yeah. I think it's pretty apparent in your writing that you are. A, a, well, a, I mean, but I mean, I think any, you know, whatever, like you should care about words, right? Like if you're, if you're, uh, if you're trying to, you know, so it's, that's, you know, that's just a thing. Like I, I do not want to be, you know, what I have been in the past, which is a guitar player who likes to sing. And now the band's written a song and there needs to be words. So we better slap something in here yeah. so I can sing. I don't really want to do that. You know, I want to know that, um, that I'm trying to communicate with words because that's, it's, it's half the, it's half of what anybody, I mean, and honestly, like a lot of times I think the voice is what people, even, even people who think that they're, I mean, this sound, that sounds, that sounds belittling, but, but even people who are really dedicated music fans, really the majority of people, what they connect to in a song is what is being sung to them. Yeah. You know? And so I don't want to, you know, and I'm not saying any that I think any of my stuff is particularly good. I just know I don't. I know I want it to. I want to do the best job that I can do, because it's like, you know, it, it's because that connection is really important. And and for whatever reason, in my little journey of my life, playing music and making music and playing it in front of people is a way toward connection and so i don't want to squander it by just saying a bunch of bullshit <laughs> you know yeah. so so you know i mean um i think if if i could dig into maybe what would be the uh last leg of the conversation uh i think if i were in your shoes the burden of taking someone else's art and and kind of uh, you know achieving a, a certain sound style and, and and power for them uh, at their behest, I, I I I would feel the weight of that personally. Maybe because I don't have the talents you have, but uh, do you feel kind of that 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 uh, that stress of of you know being a producer, being being someone who engineers for other musicians as well as yourself is that something that weighs on you or does that kind of come more simply because you're not as psychically and emotionally attached to the uh uh content um i mean i i, I don't usually think of it as a really heavy thing i'm usually just really grateful if people want to you know like i like I love it. It means a lot to me if, if, if someone thinks that I'm the person that can help them get to where they're trying to go, you know, in, in making a record and sort of 
they're, if they, you know, have heard what I do and they go or heard something that I've done and they go, Oh, well, that that's the person that can help us achieve what we're trying to achieve. Then, I mean, I take it seriously mm-hmm. very much so, but you know, it's, it's, I mean, the studio is, you know, there are times that the studio is, is, um, can be stressful, but for the most part, it's super fun and great. And like, so it's a, it's, you know, I mean, it doesn't weigh on me so much as, you know, I take it seriously. Like I want to, you know, I I mean, it's also, it's also, uh, one of the great rewards of doing studio work is to me, it's a constant confirmation that there isn't just one right way to do things. Mm -hmm. And so it's the, one of the great, rewards of it is kind of figuring out what works for the, what works best for the people that you're working with to get them where they're trying to go. And invariably you'll learn something from that experience. You know, it might not always be technical. It might be something, you know, that's almost, you know, it might be more like a life lesson, but that's, that's why it's great. You know, this is a microcosm. It's like a, like you get into a situation that is, you know, really charged because everyone is, it's this, it's not always a limited time frame, but for the most part and stuff that I've done, it's like, okay, the band has all, these individuals have all agreed. These, these are the days they can get together and just focus a hundred percent on executing their vision and everybody's all in and you're watching it kind of, manifest you know in this intense period of activity and it's there's it's wonderful you know Mm -hmm. so so i just feel like well i'm really lucky that i get to do that and you know i'm and i have to and i am going to remember to be you know like my job is to is to help so it's like i'm going to remain humble and try to, you know, be engaged and, and useful. And sometimes I really luck out and people ask for more of a creative contribution from me. And that's always really fun. And then, you know, sometimes my job is just to like, know when to get out of the way. And that's also really good. So, um, you know, so it's just, yeah, I mean, I mostly just feel, I, I, I don't think of it as a heavy thing. I just think of it as like, wow, I'm, I'm really psyched that I get to do this because it's also endlessly inspiring, you know, like to what, to like, just to see, get a, like an exploded view of people's ideas about music making and, and how to put things together and, you know, um, and the ways that their energy comes out. It's like, I mean, hugely inspiring. So. Especially since, like you know, like maybe there isn't a, a a distinct sound because there there are very disparate groups that you've worked with over the years, but there's always a similar quality, I, I guess would be the best way to put it. Like there's a, there's a well, there's there's a there's a certain quality to everything you are involved in studio wise that that it it has a. a a presence of clarity. Everything's like the, the things that should be out front are out front, but also the, the base never gets lost in any of your mixes. Like anything that well, you, that's nice. <laughs> and I, I, you know how the base can end up being very muddy. I mean, yeah, like some obvious examples are obviously like master of puppets. Like you can't hear the bass in it, but even, even more so like, you know, there are, there are groups where the bass player is really, really amazing and you can't really discern what's going on there. I've, I have yet to come across anything you've been involved in where the bass player gets lost or muddied in the mix. Everything's very clear and very, uh, you know, the low end is as forward as the high end. And, you know, they're not really cut out by the vocals that's an art. That's something that I I know having been a musician for the majority of my life, I, I don't think I could really pull off, 
you know so there, there's you, you have a knowledge of sonics that i think most people don't really have well well thanks <laughs> you know i mean I, you know but hope, hopefully because i've been doing this for a long time so i hope that's yeah, true you know yeah like i mean a lot of it is just kind of like paying attention you know like i mean i hate i don't that's, that probably sounds silly but I feel like a lot of it is trying to make sure to pay attention to the right things at the right time, mm -hmm. you know? So hopefully it works out more often than not, you know, I mean, but you know, I definitely, I definitely don't feel like, I feel like if you have a band, everybody's role is important. You know, there isn't just, it isn't just about, you know, one, one thing to the detriment of other things, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's like I said, this is the, 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 the reason that I love doing that kind of work is just because it's a, it's a microcosm of, you know, I mean, every, every project should, you know, there's things you fall back on and there are things that I know that, you know, that I do certain certain things that I do um, that are, I would say are sort of like defaults or they're, you know, I have like certain itches that I like to scratch in a mix, you know, where I'm like, it doesn't sound right to me until I do these certain things. And so, so I might bring that every time, but you know, I have to realize that if there are times that, that these fallbacks of mine or these things that I, that I love my kind of, some of my go-to things, I have to be able to go, yeah, it's not really working this time and just be prepared to let go of it, you know? Yeah. So it's, which is good. That's a good, that's, that's a good, that's a good lesson too, you know? So, um, you know, that's, but that, that's how it should be. I think whatever it amounts to, it's like, you know, you're, you're supposed to be paying attention because you're helping someone do something that's really important to them. You know, that's, that's pretty singular. That is even in some cases, you know, it's like, it's like their whole life is in this, this moment, you know, yeah. you're creating something, whether you, whether you're, it's intentional or not, your, your whole life is, is going into it, you know? So, and that includes, that might include something like your parents telling you, don't waste your time making music because you're just going to die in the gutter. Like you don't even know, like, so <laughs> it's such a, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's enough, yeah. there's enough pieces to everybody's puzzle and when they're creating something um, and it's several people working together, all those things are in the mix. It's like amazing. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, it really is because I mean, there, is there a greater form of self-expression than creating music? I doubt it. I doubt it highly. I mean, it has the, the fact also that it's social is, you know, the actual act of, of playing music, people playing music together and working, working these things out together. That's a, it's a, it's a, there's a social piece. That's, that's the that's best really kind of cool, gang to be know? in. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't, that's not always true. And, you know, and, I mean, I guess it's probably true if you're making a film for sure, it's true, but you know, if you're doing drawings, maybe that's just, you might like show your friend your drawing, you know, or be like, let's, yeah. let's go, let's go down to the park and draw together. But it's not like, you know, it's 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 not a it's not it's not the same thing energetically so you yeah. know it's it's great i mean it's great <laughs> and i i can i can tell you from experience being uh on the side of uh the writer author um that's a very singular very solitary creative endeavor mm -hmm. Con conversely music and its creation and execution is very social it's very uh symbiotic in its way yeah, yeah. you know so uh, i mean i i'm lucky i get to experience both maybe one more than the other now that i'm you know on the cusp of 50 and not making a living playing music but i i'm i'm very fortunate that i get to sort of uh experience and glean from both sides of that coin and I think, you know, most people don't get that. Most people don't get to at least sample that. 
You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But there's a, I guess in closing, what I, what I really want to know too is what is this, what's this tour like versus touring in your twenties? Uh, wow. It's pretty different. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really different. I mean, it's different in, on like loads of different levels. Right. Because I mean, I'm glad that Gordon's with me because I think I might, I mean, I wonder what it would be like. Like, I wonder what it's like for Bob because Bob is literally touring in a car with his guitar Mm -hmm. and he's completely self-contained. He shows up, does his thing. There's, there's nobody else. It's just him. And like, I wonder what that would be like for me. Um, but you know, I mean, it is different just with me and Gordon in a car versus a whole band. Um, you know, and it's, it's so different than, you know, if I was going to do this tour in my twenties, I might not care if I slept on people's floors that I had only just met or whatever. And, you know, whereas like we got hotels from most or Airbnbs for most of this tour. I mean, a lot, loads of things are, it's so, it's so different that it's almost like too huge of a subject, you know, cause it's like we're playing, um, on this to this tour of this Northeast leg is all kind of almost all performing arts centers, which are, you know, usually it's like an old theater in a small town that's been sort of refurbished with state money and they bring through whoever, you know, it's a seated most of the time, which is not usual. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, um, and it, they all have sounded amazing, but then also it's much easier to mix like, like one of the things I love about playing acoustic shows is just not having it's, it's not having this giant apparatus of the sound reinforcement. You don't have to like, I love playing a living room show with an acoustic guitar. I love it. Yeah. I like, it's the best to me because it's just like your own voice. The instrument is resonating right there physically. You know, it's, it's just like, there's not, all this kind of technology. Sometimes when you have playing acoustic with like a loud PA and a sound person out front, who's used to mixing rock bands, suddenly it's just this, this version of yourself is kind of roaring back at you in this ear shredding way. That's just like really alienating and strange. But on this tour, anyway, it hasn't been like that. It sounded really awesome on stage everywhere. And I can hear Gordon and I can hear me and that's all there is. It isn't, you know, I haven't lost my, I always lose my voice and um, like band tours because I'm just trying to keep up with the, with the sheer volume of it all. And it's so amazing to be on a tour where I don't lose my voice. And so, I mean, it, it's, it's completely different. I mean, I'm, I'm also going a little stir crazy because it is so pared down. Everything about it feels so, so pared down that if we're not playing shows, I almost kind of don't know what to do with myself. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it's a short tour, so it's not that big of a deal, but yeah. Right. So there's not even like time to miss anybody like, you know, maybe what would have occurred back in the 1990s where it, it became extensive and, and exhaustive. Right. Right. It was much more normal for us to do like a six or eight week tour and that I don't think anybody, in, in, whether it's a Jawbox tour or it was like me doing solo shows or whatever, I don't think anyone wants to go and just be that much of a nomad, you know, anymore in our fifties. We wanted we want to go and have, you know, the thing, the whole thing, thing of touring is, to me, it's like you have a band and it's this little like this engine that can take you to different experiences and you go to different places that you couldn't have gone otherwise, and that. I still want to do, you know, that's still very real to me. Um, but, um, I, but you know, you don't want to, you don't want it to in your twenties, you're like, nothing could, nothing feels like a kamikaze mission. You're just like, yeah, let's go. And you know, the older you get, you're like, actually you see a, you're like, that's a kamikaze mission. We're not going to do that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, you know, whereas this mission is going to be good. So, you know, this will be these, 
it's, you know, you start to understand sort of what you're willing to put yourself through a little bit more, but I still have a pretty broad range of things that I'm willing to put myself through. Um, <laughs> to, I mean, for really compared to some other people I know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but it's narrowed considerably since I was in my twenties for sure. Well, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, cause you want to live intensely, but in order to live intensely, you also have to like go on living. So, yeah. 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 The next day has to be at least implied in order for it to be for the abandonment yeah. to make sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well said. Well, listen, this has been kind of a dream come true for me because you, you've actually lived up to all the intellectual expectations I unfairly put upon you. And oh, man. <laughs> I super appreciate that. That's, that's, that's pretty wild. And, uh, but, you know, I'm, I've really been, I've never been disappointed by anything that had your stamp on it. And I just want to ask if, if, you know, when the next thing comes about the next record, the next tour, would you come back on with me again? Yeah, sure. Thank you. No, I'd love to. You're going to, you're going to love the, um, the club record that I do with all the auto tune and, uh, uh, <laughs> turntable scratching. And, uh, <laughs> if you do it, I'd yeah. like it. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't think it was. Serious. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be happy to do that. But, <laughs> but no. Yes, that would be. That would be great. Sure. I'd love. I, I, I really appreciate. I really appreciate you inviting me on and um, let me ramble like this. So thanks. Oh man, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night, my friend. Yeah, you too. Take care, Peter. Bye bye now. Bye. And there it is, folks. My discussion with one Jay Robbins. And it really is a dream come true to talk to him. I've legitimately loved everything he's ever been a part of. Um, his music means the world to me. I really don't know how to properly convey that other than say it. And I'm saying it. This man has made incredible music that so many of my contemporaries and myself have love beyond words Jawbox will always have a very very big place in my heart but so will Burning Airlines so will everything Jay has done it's all incredible and it's all worth your time so with that being said he's been Jay I've been Peter you've been beautiful take care of each other everybody from 3.33 a.m. studios this has been the book of very very bad things podcast good night everybody <laughs>